and hello everybody it's Dave today's lecture is going to be on early medieval Europe and we are recording a little bit differently today we are recording with the QuickTime player instead of Screencast-O-Matic which has been finicky so we will see how this does so wish me luck here the early medieval Europe is the first part, uh, first of three parts, I should say, of the Dark Ages, and the other two being Romanesque, and then finally Gothic art, and those together make up this period of time after the fall of the Roman Empire and prior to the beginning of the Renaissance. Now, with late medieval Europe, there's not a whole lot known about this time period because it was incredibly unstable. There are really no large buildings that we can really look at, or at least very few of them survive. And the same thing with the artifacts as well. Now, the first image that we're going to look at is going to be about the Sutton Hoo burial ship. And it's going to be taking, taking place over on the Suffolk coast of England. And in this farm, and you know, this was one of these cool artworks that has been found recently. Um, 1938 is when these, basically a series of mounds were excavated from this farm. And the largest one, and you can see here's the, uh, the different mounds that were there. All of them were excavated. There was only one mound that had artifacts still left within it and it is basically this burial ship that we call the Sutton Who Burial Ship, which had a tremendous amount of treasures inside of it, including uh, the remains of a person who most likely owned the material. Now, the Sutton Who Burial Ship is symbolic, meaning that it never sailed the seas. Um, it was just basically used as really a glorified coffin. And the person who was buried within this was thought to have been the ruler of this area. What's great is we get to see some material that would have otherwise been lost, but it gives us a glimpse as to what life was like back then. For instance, not only do we have this absolutely beautiful purse cover that you would go to the British Museum today to see it. But we have also some other elements, and I'll bring this over here to this image, um, are, for instance, uh, buckles. And we have helmets, silver bowls, spoons, shields, armor. And so also here uh, below the shield is the gold coins, that would have been in the purse that we had just seen. Uh, the purse cover really is the only thing that survived. The bag itself disintegrated uh, centuries ago. But the if we go up back to the purse cover, you can see how absolutely beautiful it is. Uh, there's some cloisonne that's present. Uh, when we look down at the specific images, it definitely is uh, a reminder of something that's real similar to the pictorial of Sinestret II. In fact, we have kind of this uh, frontal figure of a, a person being attacked by wolves, and you can see that their mouth is open and they're almost as if they're screaming. There's another burial ship called the Osberg Burial Ship, and this is really something left over from Viking times. And the Vikings traveled everywhere, um, throughout the Norwegian coastline to England, Russia, Iceland, and even North America. They would attack, conquer, and colonize. And this ship, just like the Sutton Hoo, uh, found underneath an earthen mound, richly decorated, uh, again for ceremonial use, for the burial of Queen Asa. 
and it's her name is spelled A H S A. Uh, she was accompanied to the grave with a young slave girl, furniture, and different equipment such as kitchen material and agricultural equipment. There were also 12 horses, an ox, three dogs that were sacrificed and buried there, uh, dough for bread, dried blueberries and apples, no precious objects like we saw with Sutton Hoo. Um, if they had been any, they most likely were looted uh, again centuries ago. The ship itself has been reconstructed and it is uh, quite stunning. It's 63 feet long, 18 feet wide, and you can definitely see these intricate carvings that are uh, on the bow and the stern. Up in Scandinavia, we're going to take a look at this really cool type of church called a stave church. And the reason it's called a stave church is that there are four timbers used at the very center of this structure, and those are called staves. They have uh, steeply pitched roofs with wooden shingles, and the steepness protects the walls not only uh, from the rain and snow, but also the, the church takes on kind of this pyramidal form. On the gables, you can either see crosses or you can see uh, dragon heads. And those are protectorates of both trolls and demons. Now, back in the day, these churches would have numbered in the thousands, approximately 2,000 of them throughout Scandinavia. But today, there's only about 28 that remain, and the Burgund Stave Church is the best that is intact. Most of the others, they were rebuilt using parts of other original churches. And you can imagine with the lack of windows here, how dark the inside of these churches would have been. There is a roof uh, that kind of is uh, protecting, protecting the walkway that goes around the church, similar to an ambulatory like we saw in Santa Costanza and San Vitale. These are also very, very uh, dark churches because they are uh, covered with tar and the tar is reapplied every five years. And we have the, the portal for the church. Uh, which is pretty awesome. It's very graceful with elongated animal forms intertwining with flexible plant stalks. And here is a, a close-up of the walkway and you can see how the tar is caked onto the wood. I'm also going to briefly talk about the equestrian portrait of Charles the Bald. And this is um, important because during the second half of the century, there is a new force that emerges on the continent of Europe, and that person is Charlemagne. The empire that he establishes is called the Carolingian Empire, and he rules it for nearly 50 years. He imposed Christianity throughout the empire, and Pope Leo II, uh, who crowned him emperor at St. Peter's Basilica, declared him to be the successor of Constantine, who was the first Christian emperor. And for years, this sculpture uh, was thought to have been of Charlemagne, but now we know it is not. It's actually Charlemagne's grandson, Charles the Bald. But it does recall the equestrian statue that we looked at earlier on uh, in the Roman chapter of Marcus Aurelius. The sculpture at the left, though, instead of being life-sized, is sadly about 10 inches in height. But it is still all about glorifying the ruler. Uh, you can see the sword scabbard uh, at his left-hand side there. Uh, the orb that he holds in his hand is a sign of power. 
and he does have armor on underneath a ceremonial robe. Uh, Charlemagne wanted to restore the Western Empire as a Christian state and revive both the arts and learning. His palace complex in Aachen, Germany, even housed a private chapel, which is where he's buried today. And it's in the same octagonal shape that we saw San Vitale in, uh, in Ravenna. And so I'm going to stop the recording here, and we're going to go ahead and... Uh, pick this up again. We're going to talk about medieval books for a short time.